from, uh, for holding the instrument or for selling the instrument or for, for anything, or even if the market for a financial instrument disappears, this will not be the reason for changing the accounting from fair value to cost. You know, as you can recall that, uh, you know, under IS 39, uh, held for trading instruments uh, originally were not allowed to, uh, to change the classification. So if you have classified anything as held for trading, it should remain in health, as held for trading. But in October 2008, during the crisis, a change was made in the IS 39, which allowed that in case the active market for the instrument disappears, and there are extreme rare circumstances, and if there are certain conditions are met, then you are allowed to reclassify even the held for trading investments to available for sale categories or held to maturity category. That relaxation was given based on the market factors. So under IFRS 9, if you have made something as fair value, no matter what happens to the market, what happens to the uh, fair value basis, whether available or not, is still to be, uh, they, it will not be allowed to reclassify it out of that category. So achieve, to achieve the consistency, to, 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 to achieve the, to eliminate the opportunities for uh, you know, earning management and all that is the objective behind this. Okay, so what is the effective date of the standard? You know, ISB's effective date for IFRS 9 is January 2013, but the standard is available for mandatory, uh, is early adoption also. And the, the standard says that this, the, 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 if you ch want to change from IS 39 to IFRS 9, it has to be retrospective change so that all the assets on your balance sheet on the date of application of IFRS 9 needs to be reassessed into two categories, whether the instrument will get into the fair value category or onto the amortized cost category. And the difference on the adoption between the present carrying value and either the amortized cost or the fair value under IFRS 9 would need to be taken to the opening balance of the retained earning. This is the transitional relief that is available for 2011. From 2012, if somebody wants to early adopt this standard, uh, the comparative figures would need to be restated as well. So in 2013, if the standard is applied on its mandatory effective date, then it has to be a full retrospective restatement uh, for accounting the change from IS 39 to IFRS 9. Now, I, as you all know that, you know, in Pakistan, the adoption process is not ISB only, but SSCP has to notify the standard and ICAP basically normally recommends the standard for adoption in Pakistan. And what I understand is that the ICAP is already working on the standard and there is a special committee uh, which is reviewing the various requirements of the standard and which will then eventually propose the standard for adoption to the SSCP. Uh, you know, that will take some time. Now, I just wanted to, uh, you know, give you a, a, a brief on uh, the world over, uh, the global trend in the application of IFRS 9, whether in Europe, you know, also uh, IFRS is, has to be uh, adopted by the European Union because under the regulations, unless the European Union endorses the standard, it cannot be made applicable. So IFRS 9s, you know, since was issued uh, based on European Union's comments and European Union was in the forefront criticizing IS 39 and requiring ISB to come, with, come up with a simple standard. But unfortunately, uh, European Union still wants to see the total uh, project, total phases of the IFRS, 39, uh, IFRS 9 before it commits or endorses the standard for uh, application in the European Union. So at the moment, uh, European Union also is studying the standard and what they've said is they want to analyze not only one part, which is IFRS 9, but they want and to wait till the time the whole, the other parts, which is regarding the exposure draft of impairment methodology and hedge accounting. So if when all the parts will be complete, they will have a look at that standard and decide whether to adopt the standard in the European Union or not. So that is something also which is pending 
regarding the adoption of the standard as far as the European countries are concerned. Regarding the US, you know, uh, as I said, although the US is fully committed to converge with IFRS, and also they are closely working with the ISP on various joint projects regarding financial instruments, but, you know, what we see is that there is an inconsistency, I would say, in approach uh, as far as the valuation model is concerned, because uh, the US FASB is still pursuing to adopt a, a full fair value basis uh, valuation model rather than certain assets at amortized cost and certain assets on a fair value basis. So I think this is a, this is a major point of, uh, I would say, inconsistency between the two boards which they would try to resolve in, in times to come in a year or so and what we can expect perhaps either the ISV will make certain changes to the IFRS 9 or the US GAAP will change to converge with IFRS 9. So, you know, that is the status as regards the IFRS 9 adoption in the Europe and the US, but uh, I am very, very hopeful that uh, since the uh, regulators, accountants, and many stakeholders around the world are pushing it very hard on both the boards to come up with a high quality, uh, globally acceptable standard on the financial instrument, so this convergence will happen somehow in a years to come. And I would also, you know, expect the ICAP committee to, uh, to come up with their recommendations on the adoption of IFRS 9, on the potential benefits and the potential uh, problems and issues, the tax issues, the legal implications, the issues surrounding state banks and prudential regulation for the purposes of um, its adoption in the bank. And also, you know, as you know, IS 39 at the moment is also deferred for banks in Pakistan, so, uh, you know, 12 years have gone by. So I think this gives us perhaps an opportunity that uh, even though we have not applied IS 39 to banks, perhaps we can uh, start looking at IFRS 9 for adoption to bank. And uh, I think uh, we should also give a serious thought as to, you know, still whether we want to continue deliberating on IS 39 for adoption in banks when we have a um, new standard replacing IS-39 now, so there is no point looking at a redundant standard, I would say. So this is thought is also, I think, uh, is, 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 is within ICAP, uh, uh, the, and the committee I see on the IFRS-9, I, I, I expect, is considering all these uh, aspects as well. Now, I think I would like to now conclude on IFRS-9 and would like to take any questions if you have on the accounting uh, under IFRS 9 and IS 39, as you can. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open for questions and comments on the IFRS 9, but I think as session chairman, I'll use my prerogative and perhaps raise one very fundamental question uh, to our salon. And my question is very simple. The most important objective of, you know, changing the IS-39 or replacing it with IFRS-9 was to reduce complexity. My question is, has or is IFRS-9 going to reduce complexity or increase complexity? Uh, well, IFRS-9 is undoubtedly aimed at reducing the complexity, but Actually, uh, you know, it depends on an entity to entity and what kind of financial instruments you have. But, you know, given the fact that IFRS 9 have very limited categories for classification of financial assets, which is only amortized cost or fair value. So actually, the, uh, from the user's perspective, the complexity which was driven by the fact that there are various categories and each category of financial asset have its own implication in certain cases, again, goes to the PNL. In certain cases, again, goes to equity. And there are multiple 
impairment approaches. For example, for debt instrument, the impairment methodology is different. For equity instrument, it's different. For available for sale debt instrument, the methodology is different. And for held to maturity uh, debt instruments, the method methodology for impairment is different. So sometimes it becomes very, very complex and complex.